Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm very excited to welcome you to C4 virtual workshop on transforming red in Indonesia. My name is Levania Santoso. I'm program coordinator at C4, and I will be your MC on this event. This workshop is one of seven national workshop series that C4 organizing for its global comparative study on red. In coming November and December, we'll have virtual workshop in DRC, Peru, Guyana, Brazil, Ethiopia, and a face-to-face -face workshop in Vietnam. Please visit C4 event website to mark the dates. The title of this event, Transforming Red, is based on the title of our book published in 2018 and has its intended double meaning. In 2007, Red was envisioned as a catalyst for transformational change toward lasting climate mitigation in the forest and land use sector. And yet, red itself has transformed over the past 13 years. In Indonesia, red plus payment for results achieved are finally beginning to flow, and there are diverse actors to the space who can, who can help deliver on the problem promise of transformational change. We will hear from many of these actors today as speaker and also participants. Please write your comments and questions in the chat box to make the event as dynamic as possible. Without further ado, I'm pleased to invite C4 Director General, Dr. Robert Nassi to give an opening remark. Robert, please. Thank, thank you, Vani. And, uh, <clears throat> Well, we cannot welcome you physically on our campus, then, then you are most welcome on, on the digital picture of C4 campus in Bogor, where it's currently raining. And uh, <clears throat> I hope that when we will have our past this COVID crisis, we'll be able to meet again and, and have also the discussion in the hallways and the coffee break. But uh, let's go back uh, um, today and um, about the, this workshop on, on, on red. And it's, let me first, I mean, a sort of, uh, C4 has been working in Indonesia uh, since uh, this creation in 1993, and is the only international organization uh, headquartered uh, in Indonesia as a CGI center. And, and we have had this, this program on, on red for, for a long time. And this is something that we are very proud of, and that's why it's very uh, important for us uh, to have this, this workshop now, because we are reaching a, a very interesting uh, time uh, together with our partners uh, from the Ministry of Environment and Forestry. And, and here I have to apologize on behalf of Park Rwanda, the Director General of Climate Control of the MOF, because uh, he, he was supposed to deliver uh, a, opening address or so, but has been called at, at the last minute to a very important meeting uh, with the vice minister. So he apologized and sent us his good wishes for the success of the workshop and he will uh, listen to the recording and, and the live stream. Uh, now, if you think about red, I mean, I thought it really took off in 2007 at the, at the Bali COP, uh, and then it was followed by a series of COP Poznan, Copenhagen, Paris. And here we are now in, in 2020, so 13 years after this, this takeoff, and we are seeing the first uh, result-based payment uh, coming into Indonesia, uh, one part of the uh, letter of intent uh, with Norway, another one uh, from the Green Climate Fund and for about a total of about $160 million. And, and so that, that's very timely to discuss <clears throat> this whole issue and say, okay, should we have this uh, uh, payment at the national or at the subnational level? Uh, who is to be paid for? And why are we paying people? And, and what will be the impact ultimately of such payment in terms of achieving the overall purpose of, of Red Plus? And also, quite interestingly, I mean, a sort of the, and this whole issue of payment uh, for results in, in, in a context like climate change or, or reduced emission uh, from uh, deforestation and fragmentation is the whole issue of accountability. 
if you are doing all the efforts you can or you, in terms of reducing uh, degradation, uh, and if your neighbor, whatever the neighbor is, it could be uh, uh, another Kabu Paten at the subnational level or another province or another country at the, inter at the national level it, it is uh, <clears throat> having such a behavior that it impact on your performance, uh, uh, who is accountable for it and uh, who needs to be paid or not to be paid and how is it going to work? And, and, and these things are very uh, important and, and very interesting to consider in the whole issue of the, the governance of this result-based payment. So I, I would like to thank again, uh, of course, our, our Indonesian partner, but also uh, the many partners that we have had uh, along the, this long journey of, of the global comparative uh, study on red. And most particularly, I would like to thank Norway, who, who has been uh, supporting us uh, during these uh, 10 years. And without them, we will not be there. So. Uh, thanks again, and I hope you won't be disappointed. Well, I'm sure you won't be disappointed. And uh, we are going to have a very interesting uh, meeting, very interesting uh, workshop. And we are in the good hands of Vani and Amy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Now we are moving to the next speaker. Please to invite Dr. Marianne Johansson, Councillor Team Leader, Climate Change and Forest, at the Royal Norwegian Embassy in Jakarta to give a talk about bilateral red partnership between Indonesia and Norway. Marianne, please. Thank you so much. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, and also thank you so much to C4 for organizing uh, this workshop. And thanks to all participants that I understand come from uh, many places on the planet that have uh, taken the time to to join uh, the workshop here in Indonesia. So thanks to all. Uh, so let me start. So 10 years ago, when Indonesia and uh, Norway uh, agreed to form a partnership uh, on Red Plus, we both committed to uh, sailing an uncharted sea. Uh, this meant that uh, we were trying something new and something innovative. Uh, it was bound to not be completely a uh, completely linear process. Uh, rather it was, and still is, uh, a dynamic cooperation uh, responding to challenges as they arise. Uh, I believe that in itself has uh, great value. And earlier this year, uh, we confirmed that the results-based payment for Indonesia has reduced uh, deforestation in 2016-17 uh, would be subject to results-based payment. Uh, and with that, uh, we are now moving into the first, uh, third phase uh, of our partnership, which is of course a very important step forward to us. So the government of Indonesia and then primarily through the Ministry of Environment uh, and Forestry has been very committed to uh, improve natural resource management and its governance. Uh, Minister Siti Nurbaya uh, has reformed the merged uh, Ministries of Environment and Forestry uh, and put forward a range of transformative policies uh, and importantly also has consistently implemented and further improved them along the way. Uh, social forestry, the permanent logging moratorium, uh, revision of the peat regulation, the palm oil moratorium and the NDC roadmap are all examples of this. And clearly this is a result of political leadership and not results-based payments. Uh, and I think this is an important point. Uh, uh, reduced deforesta deforestation and sustainable land use come from uh, transformational policy and their firm uh, implementation. Uh, with the current level of climate funding, uh, resource-based payments alone uh, are no real economic alternative to unsustainable natural resource exploitation. Uh, it is Indonesia's commitment to reducing deforestation that has created results. But still, uh, there are many uh, reasons why resource-based payments have an important role to play. Uh, 
and I will share three of them with you now. I think, firstly, uh, resource-based payments are based on verified emission reductions. It is payment for a quantifiable global public good. It is not a gift. Secondly, substantial resource-based payments are an international recognition of a country's efforts. Recognizing hard work and good results is immensely important and brings uh, highly deserved domestic and international attention. The money itself can also support existing reform uh, processes and accelerate action on the ground, leading in turn to, more, uh, to a more rapid decrease in deforestation. And the third point is that resource-based funding can create a chain reaction that leverage other funding. Uh, we believe uh, that climate funding will increase with time and remain hopeful uh, that uh, more donors will come on board. Uh, but where we see the biggest potential is in the emerging carbon market. Countries that have uh, emission reductions of high en environmental integrity are likely to attract serious buyers uh, that co contributing significantly to accessible funding for national uh, deforestation results. Uh, the implementation of the Paris Agreement, uh, with its modality to increase uh, ambitions over time, will drive this demand, and Red Plus has paved the way. Uh, so let me uh, finish by just underlying that the climate crisis is still here, and it urgently needs to be resolved. And we also know that nature itself, and especially the remaining rainforest, is an essential part of the solution. Continued and strong support to countries like Indonesia for their efforts to protect forests and reduce deforestation is highly needed. Uh, and resource-based payments continues to be one of the most powerful support mechanism, mechanisms to this end. Uh, clearly, they can add incentives and play a useful role uh, where there is already political commitment uh, to reform. As illustrated under uh, President Joko Widodo and Minister Siti Nubaya here in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marianne. So ladies and gentlemen, after we heard the opening remarks and highlight from the bilateral partnership between Indonesia and Norway, I hope we are all ready to further discuss about result-based payment in Indonesia, who to pay, how to set reference level, who should benefit, and how red governance can be improved to enable result-based payment in multiple levels. To give you insight of C4 work on red, let us see a short video of C4 global comparative study on red. C4's global comparative study on Red Plus is the largest of its kind. The goal is to produce information, analysis, and tools to promote what we call 3E outcomes in Red Plus design and implementation. So those are outcomes that are effective, efficient, and equitable. And this is based on more than 10 years of research, capacity building, and stakeholder engagement activities in 22 forest-rich tropical countries. And our theory of change for the project is focused on co-production of knowledge with diverse partners, ranging from governments to civil society and private sector actors, research organizations, and local communities. And really at the heart of what we do is generating and leveraging a very strong evidence base to help inform forest-friendly policies and actions at multiple levels.
Ladies and gentlemen, we will proceed with the next agenda, Result-Based Payment, Global Outlook, and Indonesia, moderated by Dr. Amy Duchel, Team Leader of C4 Climate Change Team. Over Thanks. to you, Amy. Thanks a lot, Vani. In the meantime, I want to go now to the next session, and we have three speakers who are talking about to give the global context of results-based payment, um, as well as some, some insights from Indonesia. So we will start with Mark, uh, Mark Duma Johansson from the Green Climate Fund. The exciting news of the last few months was, was the approved um, project from the Green Climate Fund to Indonesia. I know Mark has been spearheading that work um, in partnership with the government of Indonesia and many other actors. So congratulations. Um, and we're going to hear more about that now directly from the source. So Mark, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank you so much, colleagues. It's uh, it's great to be here with you today. I prepared uh, two slides. I'll quickly... Um, uh, so um, I had the opportunity and the pleasure to briefly share with you this, this fantastic highlight, as Amy said, that at the B26 meeting that took place a few months ago, our board approved the largest um, Red Plus RBP proposal so far, and the first one in Asia, in Indonesia, developed by UNDP and the government of Indonesia. Uh, so I'm quickly going to uh, take you to the project itself and, and happy to take any questions uh, later later on today. Uh, next, next slide, please. Thank you very much. So before going into the, um, the details of the project you see outlined here, um, when we receive projects within the pilot program, um, we screen them across um, a, a scorecard we have developed and you see a brief highlight here on, on, on the left side of the screen, where the volume offered to us uh, goes to this internal review process that where we look mainly at, at the frill and the technical annex and, and then score that. And then we, we, we get a final volume, which multiplied by $5 per ton is then the, the final payment. Um, in the case of Indonesia, you see here that 27 million were offered to us. And after reviewing the proposal, uh, we ended up with 20, 20 million, bringing us to a total payment of 103 uh, million um, across uh, four, uh, four years of implementation, but for results achieved in 2014 to 2016. We, we pay for past results that have been achieved between 2013 and 2018. And as mentioned, this proposal was developed by uh, the Ministry of Finance and UNDP. Um, and in, in particular, we, we are also very, very excited about the use of proceeds, which um, uh, we found to be very, very innovative. And I have the next slide, please, um, where this is outlined a bit further. And just to recap the, the first part, you see here um, a brief copy of, of the um, terms of reference for the pilot program, um, where it's highlighted that the use of proceeds has to be reinvested um, in, in activities that are aligned with the NDC, the Red Cross strategy and low carbon development plans and also be compliant with, with the GCF policies. So Indonesia and UNDP uh, developed this idea here to, um, to use this for two outputs. There's a lot of flexibility, I have to say, in how countries use the proceeds. Um, as long as they are um, um, you know, uh, in line with what is described here above 1.14, then there's, there's so much flexibility. So it's an opportunity to be very innovative. And we found Indonesia's um, idea here very, very innovative. First of all, to strengthen the, the national Red Cross architecture. But in particular, the majority of the funds are going into output two, which is to continue the support to decentralize sustainable forest governance, mainly looking at two of the key um, uh, key um, units in place already, the social forestry program and the forest management unit, uh, which are really excellent opportunities to work at the decentralized level and, and, and channel investments and work directly with communities and, and eventually achieve uh, future results. Um, so we are very, very pleased with this and very, very, very excited to, to really have this, uh, this approved uh, not, not long time ago, uh, first time in Asia and also the largest uh, proposal so far in terms of volume and funding. Um, and I believe I have maybe one minute left, Amy, so I'll be very quick, just the next, last slide, please. Just before I say my, my thank you, just to, um, to share with you colleagues that um, we have started to work on the continuation of the pilot program. 
uh, either as a direct continuation or as a, a different phase that, that uh, remains to be determined. But this is being developed as we speak. And we hope to, to share more uh, with, with stakeholders, with colleagues uh, later this year. And eventually next year have much more uh, details to, to work with you on. Uh, in particular, we look forward to, to your expertise and to your ideas on this so we can make sure that we have the best possible continuation going forward. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Mark. And I already see questions for you popping up in the chat box. You can go in there and, and address the, the, the participants. Please do put your comments um, for Mark and the other speakers into the chat box. That can be a dynamic forum for sharing ideas as well. Um, so let's move on to the next speaker. We'll have a question and answer in the chat box and at the end. This is Errol Engelson, who is a professor at the Norwegian University of Life Science and a long-term um, associate for C4. You probably know him from all of the Red Plus work he's done. He's edited our, our four major um, C4 books on Red Plus. And he's really been a thought leader um, and, and partner uh, for us on the Red Plus issue. So he'll be talking about results-based payment um, and the politics of numbers. So Errol, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, is my voice okay? Sounds good. Great. So next. Um, first, I start with a kind of a definition of result-based payment. It has got many names, payment for environmental services, output performance base, etc. But it's essentially the same idea. And it's three main criteria. First, you make an agreement on predefined results. You cannot come afterwards and say that, well, this was result-based payment, we should pay it ex post. The second basic principle is to have recipient discretion in the way that, that the agent, those implementing, are, are kind of responsible and can have a great deal of freedom in how to achieve those results. And the third is some independent verification of those results, which is important. Um, does the current RBP funding meet this criteria? Only partially, I have to say. There is not kind of a straight textbook, but some modification of that. For example, in recipient discretion and negotiation of result. Next. I talk about three challenges. And, and the question of what to pay for have two dimensions. First is where to pay along the impact chain from inputs, activities, outputs, etc., corresponding to the red faces that we all are familiar to. It's strong arguments for pay kind of as far to the right as possible, outcomes and impacts. But it's also more difficult in terms of measurement, setting reference level, sharing the risk, because the further to the right, the less control the implementer will have over the final result. It's a lot of noise and external factors. The second aspect is which outcomes, just carbon or also non-carbon benefits. And if we have non-carbon benefits, should they be included as constraints? Uh, for example, as is done with safeguards, or should it be in form of extra payment? Next, please. The ways forward, I, I have come to the conclusion that, okay, the, although the ultimate goal is to pay for results, you need also incentives along the way from all the red, uh, the red uh, stages. Focus on carbon. And, and many may disagree with me here, but I think, first of all, Climate change and, and, and reducing emission is sufficiently important to be the main focus. I think an equally important argument is that it's largely compatibility between the different goals, say biodiversity, livelihoods, adaptation, etc. Particularly if one uses payment for environmental services as, as one of the articles in the book that came in 2018 by Amy and colleagues to clearly shows. Next, please. Second is to the problem is to define the emission reduction. And that is essentially the same as setting the FRELs or reference levels more general. I use reference level baseline as uh, kind of interchangeably. An emission reduction is, is defined as shown in the figure between uh, as a difference between a natural emissions, for example, forest carbon stock and a, a reference level. Now, it has two meanings in the debate, which is confusing. What I call the business as usual baseline, which is the basis for assessing the impact, the counterfactual, what would happen without the red policy or project. And the second is the crediting baseline, which is the basis for to pay. Now, they may not need to be the same. You may kind of have a tighter um, crediting baseline than the business as usual baseline. 
Next, please. Just to illustrate how it important, I used two countries a bit far from Indonesia, but still, the time period. The Amazon fund has a rule of setting the reference level equal to the average for the last 10 years and updating. And you can see the lines here, the yellow, green, and blue, that how they have changed. Now in the UNFCC submission, Brazil says that it should have a so-called dynamic baseline starting in 1996 and then uh, being updated or years are added. Now you see the difference here between the two. In 2019, did Brazil reduce emissions? Well, it all depends on the reference level. If you choose the Amazon fund reference level, the answer is no, if you have the UNFCC submitted. So this is a clear case where kind of the time period matters enormously. Brazil, uh, Peru is another example for how to set the, uh, the baseline where they use a trend. So they extrapolate doing some simple regression analysis here, and they end up with a reference level that is higher than its. I'm not saying what, what is correct or not, just that it matters. Next, please. Ways forward, I think, to clarify the key aspects, whether it's for a national or a regional level, to clarify what are kind of eligible national or regional circumstances, the time period to avoid this kind of gaming. And third party independent review and the need also for governments to outsource some tasks to have kind of a third party to settle this. Next, please. Whom to pay? In an article also as part of the GCS, we, led by Cecilia Luttrell, we, we defined kind of six potential recipients of the payment. And Mara will talk more after on this. The, this is incredibly hard. And for example, if some deforestation may be semi-legal and who owns the reduction from, for example, a palm oil concession not granted or a policy change. Next, please. I think the ways forward, we need to balance this effectiveness, efficiency. There's no kind of correct way. So eventually it's a political negotiation. My main principles is that those that incur the cost, the opportunity cost of not being able to convert forest to agriculture or other purposes, and also the attribution of results, who made it. So this kind of links to the two essential aspects of result-based payment. It's a fair compensation to those that incur the cost, but it's also incentives to change behavior. They may not be the same, but I think these two principles should guide us. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Errol. A lot of food for thought there. And please do put your questions for Errol in the chat box, comments, anything. We already have some good observations um, happening there. So I will introduce our third speaker of the session. This is Moira uh, Moliono. Moira is a senior researcher at C4, and she'll be talking about some comparative work um, that, that relates to results payments from Brazil, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Moira? OK, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you all for making the time to be here. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the whole team uh, under Tuitu Fam and Bimo Disatrio. So it's not my work alone. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm to uh, the topic of this workshop is a results-based payment. In support of this, our presentation will show how different REDD policy actors in Indonesia, Brazil, and Vietnam perceive issues related to finance. We asked them to what extent they agreed or disagreed with standard statements on finance issues derived from earlier studies during two periods, the 2014-2015 uh, Policy Network Analysis 2 and 2017-2018, the PNA 3. And this is a very shortened and simplified uh, version of our findings to be done in five minutes. First. Uh, most actors that we asked agree that REDD plus should be a results-based system. There was uh, a complete agreement, although uh, in the last agreement was, was not as strong in the earlier survey. Many actors disagreed or were unsure. On the question who should pay, most actors in Brazil and Vietnam agreed that foreign governments should be the main uh, sources of REDD financing. In Indonesia, opinions are more divided as many actors think that funding should also come from the national government uh, budget, 
with RDD an integral part of forest governance. In the earlier slide, in the earlier survey in PNA2, agreement that markets can make a major contribution was quite high. In the last survey, however, in the 2017-18, the slow development of the carbon market has caused actors to reconsider. In Indonesia, opinion shifted to disagreement, while in Vietnam, many actors still agreed that markets are important, but disagreement and uncertainty had also increased. In Brazil, on the other hand, there was a strong agreement. As the government there is weakening environmental institutions, many actors said that the only chance for RDD within the country now is to strengthen engagement with the private sector and the market. Here on this slide, uh, we are talking about what Ariel said earlier, who should be paid? Well, in short, uh, all actors agree that everybody should be paid, but uh, the division is still unclear. There is no agreement on how. Next slide. So what does this mean? After more than 10 years of RDD, perspectives differ among countries and even among actor groups in, in one country, not only differ, but also change with changing political and economic context. Despite the differences overall, actors accept RDD as a results-based payment scheme to be supported at least partly by foreign governments. And while actors are somewhat pessimistic about carbon markets, they also feel that there is need for more efforts to develop and understand carbon markets because uh, funds are becoming more scarce. At the same time, when it comes to implementation, all actors feel there is still need for a strong and most of all clear regulatory framework, indicating they perceive the existing framework is still insufficient for RDD. Another suggestion for improvement suggested by actors in Brazil, but also applicable to Indonesia and Vietnam is, is for local and regional authorities to have more autonomy to adjust and adapt to needs for implementation at the local, more decentralization rather than less. As said, however, perceptions differ and change, while people act and decide usually based on their perception. Thus, while it is cliche, the bottom line is, that there is no one-size-fits-all formula to RDD finance or indeed to the whole RDD scheme. With growing understanding but also growing scarcity of funds, coupled with continuous changes in political, economic and social context, there is need to remain flexible and, adapt and adaptive and look for even more uh, innovative solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Moira. Thank you all. So uh, we have some questions happening in the in the chat box here, but so I'll bring some of those into the the, the discussion um, for the next ten minutes. A really interesting question for Mark from the Green Climate Fund, and it's it's not only about the Green Climate Fund payments, but it's it's sort of in general about the issue of timing of payments. So results are achieved, and payments can come many years later. Um, there was an issue in Brazil with this when the payment for the amazing um, achievement of reducing Amazonian deforestation came when Bolsonaro's government was taking over and, and sort of ironically as he was rolling back environmental and social protections. Mark, others, could you comment on this timing issue of payments? Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much for that question. Um, indeed, a very, very good question. And um, as, as noted in, in the chat box, but also maybe uh, just reflecting on what I mentioned before, um, that a key part of the, the terms of reference uh, is that the results that can be, be submitted to us have to be, uh, be achieved between 2013 uh, and, and 2018. Uh, within within that time period, uh, and 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 have to be fully you know reviewed and, and go go through a due diligence to to make sure that we have the best possible knowledge on on how these results were achieved. Um, so of course it's it's there are many cases of course where there can be certain changes um, in in politics and government that that could raise certain questions and of course it's hard to know what the future brings and how that can impact certain uh, results from the past but uh, what is what is clear is that the use of proceeds has to be um once once approved by the board uh, the use of the, the reinvestments have to be fully fully aligned with what has been approved so it cannot um 
be, be changed down the road to be something different. It has to still be aligned with what was approved at the time that it was uh, submitted to us. I hope that that answered the question uh, more or less any. Thank you. We had some other questions, you know, for, for Errol about um, similar, you know, sort of paying actors directly affected through foregone income, but then again, the results-based payments are happening years after the fact. Can governments advance these payments without actually knowing if they will receive results-based payment? Um, it's, it's a related question and, and, and an important one because landholders, you know, having incentives for their achievements is, is going to make or break this. Harold? Right, should I think? Okay, you know, it's a good question. I um, start with a conclusion. I, I like to quote a colleague that uh, he used to say that it's better to pay twice and get something than paying once and get nothing. Um, and, and, and this is a dilemma, particularly for dealing with farmers or communities where you have to make some upfront payments to kind of make them into the getting a contract contract because its costs are now and benefits in the future in the form of results-based payment. So some upfront payment and then some payments at the end when the results have been achieved. So I think therefore in practice the payment, what you have to pay, particularly when we're talking about pessimism at local level, is much higher than just paying for the results. You need to pay upfront and you need to pay at the end of the day. But Better to pay twice and get something than pay once and get nothing. Yeah. So double payment, but no double counting. <laughs> right. Now that's also another question about double counting. And, and for example, when Norway or GCF are paying Indonesia, should they deduct the projects that have already been paid for, say Katingan or whatever project in, in, a, in a voluntary carbon market? I don't think it's being done or but it would be interesting to hear from Marianne and, and and Mark whether whether that is considered by them who do that. I, I don't think as I wrote it's a major problem today, but potentially in the future. And in early red days we talked a lot about kind of this nested approach, which is modeled by what's called the joint implementation under the uh, under the uh, the, uh, the Kyoto Protocol. And in fact, Darsono Hartono, the, the lead implementer of the Katsingan project is here with us as a speaker in the sub-national session and we'll be discuss discussing some of those issues. Um, so, so we'll hear from him as well during that. Um, I, I do wanna move to the question of carbon markets because I think this is something that it's, um, you know, we're seeing increased demand of voluntary carbon markets. There's different kinds of compliance markets that are taking shape. Um, you know, even bilateral agreements under Article 6. It's it's one of the most exciting elements of, of this process, but it's also one of the most contentious. And I, I thought that Moira's slide was interesting about how, you know, perceptions are evolving of, of carbon markets and, and offsetting, um, you know, in, in different countries. I think it would be interesting to hear from the, the speakers sort of the opportunities and um, Achilles heels um, associated with these emerging markets. Moira could maybe start, we haven't heard from her yet. Not that I know a lot about carbon markets. I know more about, uh, about the way the perceptions work, but it seems that uh, there was a big hope that uh, that it was very clear that uh, that the carbon would be put on the market. Somebody was going to sell, and somebody was going to buy, and uh, this uh, whole process would uh, work as uh, as other markets. And so people perceived that that was a good way to do things, and it was clear, and it also uh, uh, brought you some equal standards in a way. So people looked at, at it as a, as a hope to, uh, to solve the problem, but it just didn't work out because it's just too, too abstract in a way. It was like the farmer in, uh, in West Kalimantan asking me, how do you, how do you package this uh, carbon? It's just, is it in a can? So 
if it were in a can, he would have known how to sell it. But because it's something that you cannot really touch and you cannot really see, it is more difficult to imagine a market. And so in the perceptions, uh, they th first thought it was a good idea, but then nothing happened and you couldn't really sell it in the can on the market. So finally, people sort of uh, lost interest in this. Still in Brazil, because of the, of the uh, different uh, uh, political situation, people are looking for other ways to, to raise money for their uh, reducing emission and deforestation. Other comments from the speakers on this, on this issue? Errol or Mark? Back and quickly. Um, I think the main thing to say about carbon markets is that they don't just appear from from uh, from the kind of from the bottom up. Uh, well, you have the, the the voluntary carbon market, but it has remained relatively small, although it has picked up a bit uh, in the last one or two years. But basically, a carbon market is created by political decisions to put caps on countries or on sectors or on industries or even you and me to for how much emission reductions we we can we can allow we are allowed to have so it's a political creation and and it's created through caps on on emissions and i can meet my, those restrictions by buying offset by offsetting buying emission reduction from others. So far, there hasn't been much will to, to take on those caps and therefore the demand in the carbon market does not emerge. I, I think, I don't see a kind of a quick kind of that markets will emerge. It will probably be a few markets like the California, like domestic markets in Brazil, perhaps with a new president, et cetera, that may be, but most of them will be kind of markets like Norway and, and, and GCF are doing that. You're buying based on emission reduction. So it's kind of a market where you pay, you buy emission reduction, pay for that. Mark, any thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, let me put my video again. But, you know, thank, thanks so much for that question. And um, indeed, we, we are monitoring uh, that closely and, and, and making sure that if if there is any progress in the future on that front, that we can react to it in the best way. Um, I mentioned earlier the continuation of the pilot program, and and we are we are we are looking very much into there to see how the private sector could play a more active role. Uh, this is still to be developed, of course, um, but we do hope to find um, a stronger role for them than we had in the current uh, that we have in the current one. So so hopefully that's that's something we can. Um, we can share with you uh, going forward, but we definitely uh, monitor this and, and 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 see how we can we can we can fit into to that development in the future. Thank you. I'll just I saw Darsono with his video on, so I just want to put him on the spot because he's been dealing with this issue for a while. Don't give away what you're going to talk about in your presentation, but Darsono, it would be interesting to hear from your perspective about the you know emerging carbon market opportunities for funding what you've been working on for a long time. Um, thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good night for some of you. Uh, thank you for putting me on a spot. Uh, for some of you who don't know me, my name is Darsono Hartono. Uh, we manage the Katingan Mataya project, which is one of the largest voluntary carbon, uh, voluntary forestry mark, uh, carbon credit project today. I think, uh, you know, for somebody who have been doing this for 13 years, we see a lot of things have changed. I think we see that uh, the fact is, you know, there is a real business uh, for forestry uh, conservation as well as restoration. Of course, the market, as some of you mentioned, is involuntary market, but I think we start seeing that it's growing tremendously because I think the fact is more and more people realize that we need nature for our survival. While we, when we talk about COP13 back those days in Bali, I think the actors are usually more of a state actors, right, playing this. But I think we start seeing a lot of this. And I think we need everybody to be involved, meaning that the Norwegian, the GCF, you know, government, non-state actor, everybody had to be involved because, you know, uh, there are benefit for protecting nature. So I think uh, we are excited. Uh, I think the market is really 
turning for, for voluntary market. Of course, everybody's betting on compliance, but like I said, like you mentioned, Amy, it can be very pretentious. Things can be quite complicated that way, but I think uh, you know, we can have this, uh, this two uh, working in parallel and then see how it goes in the next few years. Thank you, Darson. I'll just, I'll call on, I'll put Marianne on the spot now too from, from Nor Norway, because I think, you know, this carbon market issue, it is, it's it's sort of the, the issue that we're dealing with now. And I think it's the issue where we can agree on a lot of things and then suddenly we get to that and, and there's major fights and, and disagreements about how this should move forward. I'd be interested in hearing Norway's take on this. Yes, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think it's quite clear that we have been interested in carbon markets for for quite some time, uh, both interested and concerned. Uh, I think it's a fair description. Uh, we really, as I also mentioned in, in my speech, we really see carbon markets as the main potential for Red Plus Finance in the future. And I think I agree that we, we agree that we also see development when it comes to demand, the demand side, that people or companies in particular is really interested to buy. Uh, I think our point of view is that a carbon market needs to ensure uh, or to have uh, some certain elements. And the most important part for, for us would be high environmental um, integrity of the emission reductions that are being sold. So to avoid double counting, to avoid leakage, uh, uh, and to you know, have uh, reasonable reference levels, uh, all these elements would need to be there. Uh, but, and also that I think from our point of view, it's important that uh, the revenue of a carbon market, it goes uh, to the government and that it's the government regulations that, uh, and also that the, the carbon or the emission reductions is, uh, is a public good and should the revenue should also be distributed uh, back to the public. So uh, yeah, that, that's what, what I want to share about that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have some nice comments and questions um, in the chat, you know, that we're especially getting from Mark about um, sort of what the money um, will be used for and, and the importance of um, these payments in the national context. And, and maybe we could just, um, you know, Mark, if you could talk a bit about that. I mean, how you're sitting in South Korea, how are you interacting with with national stakeholders um, about about these payments and and understanding um, where results based payments will will actually go thank you thank you Amy that's that's an excellent question um, so the, the the way that we are we are set up uh, we work through accredited entities uh, and and our NDAs and and rely on the accredited entities that when they submit a project to us on behalf of a government, that uh, due diligence has been fully carried out, that stakeholders have been consulted. Uh, we, we are not able to do that fully ourselves because of our, our setup. So we rely on that, uh, that approach. And of course, uh, you know, check that uh, to the best of our possibilities. And later on, that is also uh, checked during, during evaluations and so on, uh, and, and our annual reporting. Um, but for the particular case of, of these projects, for the, the, the RBP projects, we have a, a more simplified reporting, given that base that we are paying for, for, for past results, things that have already been achieved. Uh, and here we rely fully on, on the country and on the accredited entity that what they have submitted to us is, is indeed the best way, uh, because we, we don't want to be the ones dictating how the money should be used. Uh, this is indeed a very national context and there's no right and wrong way of, of using the proceeds. Um, for all the projects we have approved so far, all countries have decided to use the, the funds very differently. And, um, and we are likely going to see also even more use of uh, diversified use of the proceeds in the future. So, so, so that's, that's very interesting. And we have two more, uh, two projects coming up for the, this current board um, in a few weeks from now where we will again see a very different use of the proceeds. So, so there, in, indeed, it's exciting and, and good to see how 
how the accredited entities really work very closely with the government to to ensure that the, this is being achieved in the best uh, possible way. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, again, please add your questions to the chat um, because the, the speakers can continue to respond to you. I, I, I'm taking a lot from the session. I mean, and, and one of the, the points is really the importance of um, high environmental integrity. It, it, it relates to, to, to all of the presentations and, and including what Marianne's comments and, and, and Errol's presentation about, about the setting of, of the reference levels. And, you know, interestingly, Errol's point about the focus on carbon, how, how in fact that is really fundamental. And, and at C4, you know, sort of since the very beginning, we took a very broad view of Red Plus, you know, that it's not only effective in terms of reducing emissions, but it's also cost efficient and equitable with, with a, a series of co-benefits. Um, and, and, at the end of the day, we do need to go back to this sort of basic environmental integrity issue because it's at the heart of of what Red Plus is. If we think about it as a as a payment for for results achieved, um, the importance of incentives. Um, better to pay twice for a result than once for nothing. I new quote from Errol. I, I like that. We we have our collection going and it's sort of interesting because it's not double counting results, but it's rather making sure that incentives get to the decision makers and and um, farmers and landholders who who really need them. And I think that's what's been lacking. Um, our work has shown so far um, more real incentives for people um, who are who are making making major changes on the ground. And then this importance of perceptions of results-based payment and you know not only bilateral funding but also carbon markets and how that not only varies by country context but over time. And I think Moira, I, I really like this longitudinal work about perceptions over time changing. Red Plus has evolved um, since 2005-2007 and and you know, in 2020, we're not in the same context that we were 15 years ago. And of course, perceptions of results-based payment and, and incentives for reducing deforestation and forest degradation are also evolving. And, and we need to understand those um, to, to really be working in, in the national context and, and making sure that, that um, these kinds of payments, even though they may be considered a drop in the bucket, can in fact have some transformational change um, um, and, and some big impacts. Marianne, you know, listed the intermediate milestones in Indonesia, the, the big policy changes that, that have come um, into effect because of political will um, and because of um, sort of in, in the name of, of reducing deforestation and forest degradation. So um, the evolving over time as well. With that, I, I will close this global session. I will turn the mic back over to Vani, who will introduce two breakout sessions where we will delve more deeply in the Indonesian uh, context. Thank you all to the speakers and thank you to the participants for your engagement. Thank you, Amy. Ladies and gentlemen, our next agenda is a parallel breakout group discussion. But before we move to the breakout rooms, we have a slightly adjustment on our agenda. Now we will have an interactive chatterfall questions. After this, I will read two questions and we'll ask you to write down your response in the chat box, in the chat box, in a maximum of five words. So again, each questions, you will respond your question. You will respond the answer in a five words only and filling that in the chat box. I will give some time for you to type your response, but please wait my sign before you enter the chat box. So I will count one to three, send, and all of us will send our answer. So let's start with the first questions. What do you think is the main challenge for effective and equitable red result-based payment in Indonesia? The question is appear on your screen. I will read again. What do you think is the main challenge for effective and equitable red result-based payment in Indonesia? Please type your response 
I will give some time for you to think and type now. Not yet, write down your answer. Okay, counting now. One, two, three, send your answer. Okay, we would like now move to the second questions. Second question is, what do you think is the main solution for the challenge? The challenge that you just write it down in the first questions. Not yet send the answer. Think a little bit, write down on your chat box. I will count one, two, three before we all send the answer. What do you think is the main solution for the challenge? Okay, counting now. One, two, three, send your answer. Thank you for your responses. Now we move to the next sessions, the implementation of red based payments, its opportunity and challenges. We will discuss this topic in two parallel breakout groups, national and subnational implementation. In a few seconds, there will be a pop-up message on your screen where you are free to choose your preference topic of discussion. If you don't see a pop-up message on your screen, please see at the below but the, at the below bar of your Zoom screen and click the breakout rooms and choose your preference topic, national and subnational.
you already answered some of that questions, but I would like to read that again so that everybody can also uh, follow the discussion and you can explain uh, more details. So the question is how then RMU get an access to result-based payment from Norway, for example, or the Green Climate Fund? But Arsono, could you please respond to that? Okay, thank you, Fanny, for the question. I think, uh, un unfortunately, the result-based payment is still in an early phase. Therefore, as a company, we, we don't know how it's going to play out. Of course, we are very excited about the news that there is a result-based payment. Uh, but I think uh, the key is has to be from a governance as well as the ecosystem uh, or, or, or the system in place that uh, the government have to make sure that Whoever get paid is are the parties that are making sure that there's no you know emission happen, right? So I think it was really go back and of course for a company like us we have to prove that uh, we work with communities and uh, we we did that. So I think uh, we are looking forward uh, for the RBP right now. Uh, as 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 you know, our project is uh, currently marketed in the entry market because that's the only source of income uh, as well as avenue uh, at this time. But I think we are we are open. Uh, for future uh, RBP uh, mechanism. As long as the key is, we have to make sure that we are nested in the national registry that there is no double counting because uh, we don't want that to happen. And I think uh, it's also created the credibility that we can work, you know, as a project developers, uh, you know, there are other avenue uh, of income rather than just a voluntary market. So we can scale up these activities and we can encourage other private sectors to be involved in this uh, uh, yeah, there, there's actually a, a follow-up question to what you just explained, Padar. So no, there's a question and then how project can that international NDC? Could you a little bit explain um, about the process and what kind of effort that RMU has been doing? Negotiation uh, and the process? Yeah, we are, we are working with a project uh, currently registered in Vera, which is a VCS, right? Uh, if you know, a lot of the credit that we have been uh, uh, selling or we have sold are actually pre-2020 credit. So it has nothing to do with NDC or any commitment of Indonesia. But I think uh, if we look at the profile of all our buyers, uh, these buyers are not uh, government. So they are actually not claiming credits. So technically, you know, what we're trying to propose to Vera right now is, you know, our buyers are different voluntary buyers. So technically, if even though they buy our credits, the ownership of NDC of the credit still belong to the country of produce. Because you know, this, this, these are corporates that are not claiming for, for, for the emission. So I think if that is the case, then you can actually scale a lot of the activities. Of course, government is, is worried about uh, you know, somebody else claiming NDC, but I think if you read it carefully in the volunteer market, there is no commitment or anything that say that you know, the credit will be transferred to another country. So it should, but of course, this is something that have to be verified and uh, confirmed uh, with Vera as well as the government so we can scale this. Okay, thank you, Padar Sono. I would like now move to pa Daddy, Professor Daddy. You have several questions in the chat box. I will read uh, for you. Uh, pa Daddy, based on your experience, how did you ensure that in all parties participate equally during the multi-stakeholder levels? Yeah, that is very delicate questions. To serve the system, the benefit sharing mechanism, we spent more than two years in order to uh, gather all uh, aspiration or uh, opinion of uh, all parties and well uh, socialist social so, i mean socialization of this uh, document is very important in order to uh, have a better uh, was that uh, uh, basis for the distribution of uh, benefit coming from uh, the emission reduction program. There are many uh, entity uh, involved in this uh, program. For instance, the uh, indigenous people and in the local community, the private sector, as well as the uh, uh, agencies uh, deals with uh, land-based sector. 
So all of those parties uh, uh, has been involved in the development of the benefit sharing uh, mechanism. Okay. But um, the next question is, how would you suggest to use the payment? How did DPI suggestion on how to use the payments? Well, um, actually, um, we expected that the uh, intensive, uh, the incentive received uh, by any uh, entity uh, can be used for uh, program or activity with continuously support the idea of uh, uh, reduce deforestation and forest degradation. So uh, through uh, governor decree, uh, we will arrange what kind of uh, activity or what kind of program is suggested uh, to be uh, done and use uh, the incentive money. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on, there are also a system to monitor whether the incentive uh, received is used for uh, continuous uh, uh, deforestation or forest degradation uh, avoid program. And how effective is the tool that you developed together with C4 facilitating this process toward uh, the national and DC process count? Yeah, uh, so far the DPI uh, run uh, the program without any consideration whether the process is already effective or whether the result is already a, a good result. So we need a really a tools to uh, do the assessment on, for instance, the process, whether the process is already involved all parties in the uh, MSF or whether uh, the members of MSF has a good uh, was that understanding about the goal of the uh, program to be achieved and about their uh, role and including their uh, resource. So the DPI tried to uh, integrate to gathering all resource uh, owned by the MSF members and use it for uh, uh, activities which is already uh, developed by involving them, the members, all the members. Thank you, Prof. Daddy. We still have uh, questions following up uh, from audience based on what Father Sono has explained. Um, there is one question specifically asking, can you elaborate further how you are working with Tile Hatta on nesting the project baseline with the national FREL. So this is a very specific. Uh, but Darsono, could you give more explanation to that question? Hi, Fanny, thank you. Um, I actually responded privately, but uh, basically we have registered our project in the national registry, right? So I think that's, uh, that's uh, something that we do because we don't want to have any double counting to the system. Uh, we haven't been talking about how to nest it to the national project or jurisdiction because um, right now there's really no, um, I guess no, there's no framework to do that yet, but I think we'll, we'll be happy to do that if you know the regulations um, allow us or want us to do it that way. Okay, thank you. I hope that uh, also answered um, to all questions related to uh, private sector engagement to national NCC. So we would like now move to uh, Gita. Do you have a question uh, from Sivor actually? Could you discuss red and forest carbon finance directly in the LTKL district, or is this less of a priority? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. So I also responded in the chat box. Essentially, from the Secretariat perspective, the main purpose for us to exist in terms of Secretariat is to help with three things for the district members. One is to help them build strategy as 
Pak Dadi mentioned. Um, and in terms of building strategy, there are five pillars that we are usually concentrating on. The first one being the planning and goal setting. Second part is regulatory and uh, policy. The third component is on multi-stakeholders decision making or governance. The fourth pillar is on measuring, reporting, and monitoring. And the fifth pillar is actually having a clear um, action plan that is agreed by uh, multi-stakeholders or we're calling it portfolios. Now, when it comes to carbon finance, uh, we're identifying multiple incentive schemes that districts can tap into. And in each of the incentives options, so the incentives sort of packages um, are divided into public and private and between private, there's you know supply chain and non-supply chain and public, there's national budget and there's also development uh, funding like FCPF etc. Uh, what we want to highlight is that within each incentives packages, there are certain rules and regulation. And when it comes to carbon finance, if you look at it from both sides, either it's directly to district government or it's involving businesses that operates in district areas such as RMU, both mandates and authority are heavily relying on national policy. So in a way, it really much it, it really depends on how national government uh, are allowing for this mandate and authority to trickle down in a way uh, district uh, can see themselves as part of a provincial strategy as is Kalimantan just described or they can see themselves as part of a strategy with forest management unit for example those are the two most visible option and uh, for both options this is something that we uh, districts are seeking guidance from the national government and the best thing that we can do as a secretariat is facilitating that discussion because essentially the one that can help district answers those questions how do you tap into red plus or carbon finance is the national government. So that's sort of our role is um, to connect the and facilitate the conversation without jumping the gun and um, overlapping the mandates and authority. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dita. Could you explain a little bit more who actually the central government that really take, that really your stakeholder targeted um, agencies to proceed this this work and run smoothly, helping facilitating the, the, the district level at the national. Yeah, so I guess I look at it, uh, at the secretariat, we look at it um, as a complete set, yeah, Mbak Lefania, we don't sort of pick and choose which one um, uh, is, you know, have a bigger mandate. But uh, if you look at the five pillars um, and you look at carbon financing and what it takes, actually district needs to be able to prove that they can elaborate on those five pillars, as Pak Dadi mentioned. Although it's a very delicate situation, yeah, um, you know, having a multi-stakeholders dialogue, having a clear benefit sharing mechanism, those things are uh, not necessarily uh, being held or guidance that doesn't necessarily come from one ministry. So at LTKL, we have five core ministries that sort of become the anchor. The first being the domestic affairs ministry, because at the end of the day, the subnational government report every year their performances to domestic affairs ministry. We also have uh, Bapenas and Ministry of Finance as the two other core sort of cross-sectoral ministries. Of course, for uh, carbon finance, it heavily uh, relate to Ministry of Environment and Forestry. But at the end of the day, in terms of benefit sharing, we do have to take into account other ministries, including the National Investment Board, the Ministry of Cooperative and Small Medium Scale Enterprises, and the Ministry of Village Empowerment. The reason being that if you want to craft a solid benefit sharing mechanism, as what Padar Sono mentioned, you actually have to really dig down and try to match make the programmatic approach between those ministries. So at the end of the day, the benefit really trickles down to the people. Great, thank you, Gita. And our speakers, we have a questions um, to you all. Um, I may welcome anybody who wants to answer it first. The question is, how do you deal with gender issue in your program or projects to promote equitable outcome for women and men? Any lesson that we can learn from these more advanced experiences? So let's hear from Alteca Elfors and then move to uh, East Kalimantan. And I would love to hear from a uh, private sector process on this um, engagement with gender issues. 
Yeah, so uh, I guess it's heavily re uh, related to all, all of the pillars in terms of representation. Unfortunately, at district level, we still see very little decision makers when it comes to government official being female. And we do need a female uh, a male balance. Um, so one of the standard that we are uh, upholding right now is, for example, if we're attending events or we're hosting events, there needs to be always three balanced, gender balanced, age balance and sectoral balance. So it's not only about the gender, it's actually about the perspective as well as the you know, intergenerational collaboration. So not all seniors and not all juniors, you have something in between. So that is what have enabled us. For example, one uh, example is in West Kalimantan in Sintang to tap, tap into different ideas that are more innovative, so to speak. So uh, one example is uh, a meeting that is hosted by the district government but are looking for innovative way to uh, reduce emission through um, tangible uh, activities on the ground ended up becoming a project where we help the women of Sintang that is producing organic rice and different types of commodities to promote their recipes that are, that are helping to protect the forest. So it becomes sort of climate change recipes contest. And the winner of that actually won um, uh, uh, an expose in Jakarta's number one restaurant, Kaum, where their recipe and their ingredients are being sourced and being cooked by, um, you know, a uh, top-notch uh, chef and be presented at the uh, restaurant for a month and be, and get uh, lots of exposure because of that. So we need to be creative in a way to make sure that it's not only about, you know, in making sure that women is there and represented, but it's actually about gathering ideas that you know women will be attracted to so that they will take part on the activities. So it's not, you know, tick box. It's actually a more creative process to see women in Sintang, what do they do? Mm -hmm. So you engage in that activity. So that's just one example from our case. Thank you, Gita. But Eddie, would you like to give or share experiences? Uh, yeah. From Kalimantan? On the speaking, uh, the gender issue is still not uh, well considered in East Kalimantan. Yeah, the dominance of uh, male is uh, very high compared to the uh, uh, female or women. And that's why uh, in this coming year, the DPI uh, plan one program to promote a gender issue, yeah? In order to increase, to uh, increase opportunity and to offer a possibility for them to be included in the uh, development program in East Kalimantan, including uh, in the multi-stakeholder forum such uh, as the DPI. We hope that in the next future, uh, well, gender issue in East Kalimantan is well, uh, was that considered. Thank you. Thank you, Padadi. And now Padesono, please tell us a little bit we are running out of time, but uh, I guess you have uh, key information about gender in uh, RMU works. Um, thank you, Fanny. Uh, I think for us, uh, you know, when we basically spoke with all these villages, not only that we care about the gender issue, just like uh, Gita mentioned, there's also age as well as the diet representative. So every time we, 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 we help them in terms of putting the proper governance system, just for example, we have signed all the MOU with the villages. We helped create this institution on a village base where we, not only that we have representative from women, but we also have a youth representative as well as the Dayak uh, representative. And I think uh, usually the women become sort of the, the, the treasurer because uh, the, they are the one who really manage money well. And I think they are more credible than men. I mean, I have to say that, you know, my wife is uh, better managing my money than, than myself. So I think uh, automatically this was being designed, but I think the key is to have a collaborative effort, really believe in that. I mean, we, you know, of course uh, it's not easy in, in a country like Indonesia where gender is still very imbalanced, but I think uh, if you find the right, uh, you know, strength and uh, the right, uh, uh, in each of, uh, especially women or, or youth, then you can actually have that and it can be very effective. So that's how we do it. And I think it's been uh, quite well. And the fact is we have a, a, a village institution. We also mandated that it cannot be a kepala desa run, right? So it cannot, it has to be really governed 
and uh, and elected democratically in the system. And we have been doing that. And this basically institution are the one who is getting funding from us in basically a grant or the benefit sharing. And we build, you know, we, we do, we teach them about proper governance, opening up a bank account, uh, reporting annual taxes and all this kind of thing. And usually I have to say the women are the one that are doing much better work than men. Uh, for, for that. So I have to say that uh, uh, it's not, uh, you know, I think uh, we don't have to be specific in terms of gender, it just automatically comes out. So. All right, thank you. So we are running out of time. It is now a quick turning uh, to all speakers to give their final remarks on how we move forward to promote transformational change through national, sub-national actions. So quick um, 10 seconds, I hope everyone, uh, we may start from Ibu Mela. Yeah, I think uh, still many, many things to, to engage with the, uh, I mean, like the private sectors also, and also the governments, how to make the sustainability development uh, to become uh, more with the partner partnership, like uh, what we found in our, our study. It's only five, uh, five partnership. Uh, so there is uh, lots to be done to, yeah. to improve okay. that. Yeah. Sorry, I need to cut you. We are yeah. only... <laughs> 40 seconds before we need to bring um, everybody um, to the plenary. I really apologize for not being able to accommodate everyone's uh, key remarks, but please do uh, speaker uh, typing it. Uh, we will uh, post it that information in the report of this event afterwards. But I would like to thank you all for participating. We have three minutes left and we're gonna end on time here. Um, you know, so many things. I, I actually saw many challenges when this event started. And as I was hearing the report from the national discussion, I was in the subnational discussion, but getting getting feedback from the national discussion, it actually struck me how much is advanced in the Indonesian context. I mean, first of all, the sort of the, the strength of the political will and the NDC that prioritizes forestry and land use. Um, this may be changing with emerging priorities, especially with COVID. Um, you know, we have to sort of keep our keep our eye on the ball of of of, of forests and sustainable land use um, in light of, of of changing priorities. Much more alignment between national, subnational, and local levels than I imagined. Subnational frels well under development. Um, local projects being integrated into the national registry to avoid double counting. Um, a lot of really, in fact, quite a bit of alignment across scales in a country where there is a heavy reliance on the national level um, to, to give the policy signals. Um, really interesting discussion on, on gender um, in, in the subnational se section. Um, and I know that also in the national um, section about, you know, the need to connect climate finance to issues of, of gender equity, um, it's fundamentally important. And interestingly, at the subnational level, lots of experience with gender, ethnicity, age, sectoral diversity, despite few female leaders at the district level trying to get as much um, um, representation as possible. So tropical forests and climate are, are key to climate and development agenda agendas. Those are not going away. Indonesia is in the spotlight. Indonesia is especially in the spotlight with the, with the new funds for, for results-based payment. RED has served as a testing ground um, for innovative policies for, for forest conservation. And it's also created a global alliance that didn't exist before um, of many different actors working towards this common goal including as we've seen uh, from the participants today. Um, now we, we need to see, I mean, as a, as a research organization, we're interested in, in monitoring the flow of those payments. Um, what are the impacts? Who is benefiting? Um, is this in fact conserving for us? And, and we'll be intending to do that. So my last words are to thank um, all of the speakers, to thank all of you in the audience. Um, please turn on your cameras and give a wave. I, I really, I would like to see you all. This is the, 
Yeah, so we can put it on grid view so that you can see everybody who's here today. It's it's really um, spectacular participation. I would like to, to thank, of course, the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, who has supported our work over many years. And I'd like to give a shout out to our Director General, Robert Nassi, who continues to support this agenda and prioritize this agenda within C4. And, and this longevity it's key to being able to develop good work, um, engagement and capacity building over time. And finally, uh, BMO is hiding somewhere in the grid, but BMO Dwi Satrio is responsible for the event. He organized the logistics, the content. He's a senior research officer. He's a researcher. He's a scientist. He stayed behind the scenes today, but he really helped us with everything. So. Thank you. Thank you, partners and friends, for being patient with our technology issues. Somehow this keeps, this, this is, a, a, it's our challenge of the virtual world, but we are, we are going to continue to, to do our best with that. So thank you. Enjoy your afternoon. Please visit our website and you will find the materials. We'll find the video that you can actually watch. You will find our publications. You will find our partners' publications. And we look forward to continuing to engage with all of you. Thanks again for your time. Thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. Audience, with that, we conclude of today's workshop. On behalf of C4, I would like to express our appreciation to all of you for making time out of your busy duties to attend the workshops. Please visit C4 website to get access of today's presentation and further information. See you in the next national workshop in DRC on the 12th November. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.